I'd like to welcome everybody again to this webinar on Indigenous leadership and food distribution. We're going to be talking with Indigenous leaders at different points in food distribution across the North. We're going to begin with the Regional Distribution Centre in Sioux Lookout. They're dealing with distribution and then to Loktaktung and Buster's Variety in Halebury, which is on the retail side. And then we'll be dealing with wild game processing uh, that's happening over at Red Rock Indian Band Moose Hanger and Butcher Shop. And finally, we are going to be speaking uh, with a new organization, the Northern Ontario Indigenous Food Sovereignty Collaborative. And um, they've been dealing with the funding side of things. So Kanina, I'm going to um, take a minute right now and just acknowledge where I'm coming from. I'm in Treaty 9 territory. I'm on the Metogamy First Nation traditional uh, grounds. This is Ojibwe territory to the north of us are our Cree neighbors and our OG Cree neighbors. Just south is Odawa and to the east are our Algonquin neighbors. So just a quick introduction of the local food and farm co-op. Um, it is a member driven network and its mission is to foster vibrant, resilient, connected and sustainable food and farm cooperatives across Ontario. They provide tools, training, resources and support for food and farm co-ops at the local food sector. And this webinar is part of their co-op field school program, which provides assistance in building our cooperative knowledge. And um, in, in this particular case, indigenous led leadership in food distribution in Northern Ontario. Next slide, please, Kanina. So who am I? I'm the Northern Food Distribution Network Coordinator and this network was launched in 2019 and it was created to foster the improvement, resilience and accessibility of Northern Ontario food value chains. This network brings together leaders and food system actors from all across Northern Ontario that work together on projects to improve the conditions of food distribution here. Now, I'm very happy to introduce um, our first speakers. Bruce Sakakeep is the Chief Executive Officer of the Potato Win Development Corporation and the RDC Project Lead for Kitchen and May Kusip in a wig. Um, he's been working in various capacities for the majority of his employment. He was previously involved with the economic development back in the 80s and early 90s. And he was seconded to KI Economic Development Manager in 2010 to restructure and revamp the KI Economic Development um, uh, component. Uh, in 2014, Vicki Blanchard became the Economic Development Officer of the Municipality of Sioux Lookout. And with her, she brings 27 years of experience in public education, health, and the private sectors. Vicki has forged successful project partnerships with key businesses, industry, tourism associations, government, and First Nations. Now, Vicki has a slide presentation that uh, she's going to share with us. So I'll hand it over to you, Vicki. I wanted to, um, I wanna thank you all for, for um, inviting us to participate in, and um, my office is located on the traditional lands of Black Soul First Nation. Uh, the municipality of Silicon as provides um, education, health, justice, uh, commerce, um, social services, children's services to 33 far north um, communities located in the NAN territory. Um, Laxwell Wolf First Nation is a member of Treaty 3, but also participates um, at, at the table for uh, NAN. So in we started our journey, Bruce and I, in 20, it started in 2013 and, and uh, Bruce and I we introduced to each other in 2014. Um, move forward there. So we, so how I've I've come to this presentation is sort of the coming together of the beginning, keeping together as the progress and working together as success. Next, uh, Sulacote has been on a long journey from late 1800s to more recently. We did have a grid that used to show how often we met with our neighboring First Nation communities and the gaps now overlay, overlap each other versus gaps 
they, they're overlapping. So the Cooper um, uh, Friendship Accord was established in 2012. And, and um, in 2017, KI joined. It was the first Far North community. And it was through a community economic development initiative funded by FCM and can do. Go ahead. So food insecurity. Uh, I mean, we can read all of this, but as such as poor governance and lack of institutional support, food insecurity can be transitory. When it occurs in times of crisis, seasonal or chronic, when it occurs continuing basis, most often food insecurity is owning, owing unequal distribution. Next. The chiefs of the Friendship Accord, Lac Sewell, First Nation, Cat Lake, Slate Falls, and KI, determined in 20, 2014 that the project that they wanted to attempt to, to work together on was a regional distribution center. And the underlying purpose was for the health and wellness of the far north communities and how they were suffering from diabetes and other um, social issues um, underlying um, the lack of um, distribution of, of healthy foods, um, medicine, and, and uh, goods and services. So, um, we went as far as um, reaching out as far as the region, nine regional chiefs in our district and the chiefs and the mayors had a gathering to determine how important this project was to the far north and to the region as they are one of our leading um, economic um, influences in, in purchasing power in North, northwestern Ontario. And it was determined at that level that most of the chiefs from NAN territory in the far north had never spoken or met a mayor in their whole career. And so this was a real moving opportunity to go for it. We went then, took our guiding principles and we took it to all levels of government who said that they too would work together with us to see this project, a regional distribution center located in Northwestern Ontario at the Sulacout airport. Mover. Why did we do this? Well, you can see where Lac Sewell is from us. It's road accessible. And then you can see KI, how far it is and, and several hundreds of kilometers, over 300 kilometers. And what, what I'm showing here is this was the beginning. We did a, a feasibility study and to get $29,000 worth of food to a community, it would cost $23,000 in shipping. And the cost of uh, four liters of milk in Winnipeg was $4.59. And in KI, they sell it for $14 plus dollars. Go for it. So why Sulacout? The chiefs felt, well, this is our home. This is our other home. This is a hub. This is where we come to be born and this is where we come to die. It is our second home. 200,000 passengers annually go through our airport. 30,000 movements annually. So the strength of this project was based on location, partnerships, and determination. The hub of the north is known for Sulacote's tag, and we're connected by road, rail, and air. So in keeping together in the progress, we started with Sulacote and the hub of the north, servicing 33 far north uh, communities, which encompasses over 36,000 people. The Regional Distribution Center project started in 2013, KI, Laxville First Nation, as you can see, 432 kilometers away, remote access. One of the consultants from KI used to drive down in the winters and it took him 11 hours on the ice road to get to Sulaco. We would pack him with three meals. As we go forward, we then, I call it the MAC. Bruce pronounces it much more eloquently and will probably attest to that shortly. Um, but it's a 100% owned company and they partnered with a, another company um, an indigenous partner who has 86 years of experience in logistics in the far north, and that is Morgan, the Morgan family in Sulacote. Max Morgan is, is leading this charge with Bruce Sakaki. Our regional partners, we have the blessing and council resolution from 33 far north chiefs, Sulacote First Nation Health Authority, Northwestern Health Unit, and the municipality of Sulacote. So, the lessons learned here is you need to build, build strong, strong partnerships move forward. In, eight, um, in 2018, 
um, SLAM, or well, we call it SLAM, but Silico First Nation, or not SLAM, Silico First Nation Health Authority, SLIFNA, um, um, joined us um, in, in, in advocating for this project. But in the times of crisis, in 2020 entered COVID-19. At that point in time, they were required to be the support for 33 Far North communities, and they had nowhere to store the food. We sent food back to Thunder Bay three times in one day, and it would come back again, hoping that we would have a place to put it or get it on a plane. At this time, they decided that they would be a full-time partner and an anchor in a new facility, and that has given us legs. As the government said, we don't believe that a regional distribution center for 33 Fine North communities is viable, feasible, and therefore you need to find us strong anchor communities. That being said, 2020, we are now, we've been working with Health Canada, Indigenous Service Canada for five years to try and see if that they could move their stores into a brand new regional distribution center as it's in the old Indian hospital known as a zone hospital in the low basement, which is hundred years old. And it's not a nice place to work. We are getting some traction and we're hoping that this will result in a multi-purpose facility and essential services because during COVID, it's not only food that's important, it's being able to get medicine to people. It's about the, the addictions and getting needles to people and all of these other uh, uh, social needs of the community that are dire. Move forward. Since this project started, Ontario Fruits and Vegetable Growers Association partnered. We actually were uh, lobbied for this program for the far north communities and the Northwest Health Unit actually put their dietitian in our office for a couple of years to coordinate and be assisted by us in, in implementing the project into the schools in the far north. Local Foods Farms Co-op, I want to thank them. They've been with us from the beginning and they've been nothing but great advocates. Northern Food Distribution Network too has also been I, I've gone back to the beginning in this project. Recycling Council of Ontario has now reached out and partnered with us this year. Business Finland, Big Rock Technologies, Lakehead Universities are looking at innovative in aviation and drone systems to implement. University of Toronto, cargo data for Northern Ontario and transport logistics. If you build it, they will come. That has been our, our, our stand and their stand as well. We will be there when the facility is there. They have all committed written letters of support. Move forward. So seven years later, we are still without a sustainable infrastructure and an efficient distribution network to supply essential goods and services to the far north. At the best of times, food insecurity in the far north is a chronic problem. And during a time of crisis, it is a crisis within a crisis. Feasibility versus social responsibility, we don't believe that you can measure feasibility over the wellness and, and, and the safety under human rights of the far north people. So the lessons learned in our process is never give up. We are on our third time standing around in a phase two approval process that we submitted again early fall. And we're still working with the governments to have them support us and understand so when we're looking to develop food hubs and distribution centers, you really need to find, have patience, determination, and never give up because it's not something that anybody understands. Go forward. Go forward. So I'll leave it at that. Now, Bruce, I'd like you to chime in here, um, if you could, please, and uh, just, um, Pravid, you are the partner community and owner of this new facility that has been incorporated this year or last year. Last year, bonjour. Um, this is Bruce Sakaki from uh, KI. Um, it's been it's been quite a journey from uh, from the time we started. Um, KI initially started a process, I think it was in 2011, and it took, it took us a good two years to go through all the screening through the uh, CEDI and the uh, FCM process of selecting 
uh, a community to partner with a municipality, another, uh, I'll call it a, uh, an accessible year round First Nation, which was Lac Sul in Sulacote. And uh, that was, I was kind of surprised that, um, that, that KI was selected to be a part of the process. But going back to, to the inception of this relationship, um, one of the things that I could never forget about and I re really am very grateful for is the fact that KI took the step in, in establishing a relationship with the municipality that they have done business with a number of decades before officially in relationship that that has been in existence for quite some times prior to our official engagement and also our official connection with the uh, with the municipality of soil code and that's something that uh, has that was never in my understanding was never done in Canada, having uh, where a First Nation, which is an isolated community, develops a partnership, a good working relationship with the municipality. I could now also never forget the uh, the impact our presentation had when we were in Toronto, I think it was, during a candle conference. And uh, it was kind of disheartening at times when you listen to comments from people from across Canada saying that they can't even have a relationship with a municipality or a non non First Nation entity, even when it's adjacent to their reserve or community. And and uh, that's what key. That's one of the motivating factors for myself in in trying to realize in establishing a regional distribution center, or what we call it now, Mawa Sagatas Nigavik. What that uh, basically is, people like, we know as native people, our, our original language is slowly dying off and it's evolving into something else than what it was originally was. Like when you look at, when, when you break down the word mawasak means together, now the most common word used these days is mamo, together. Whereas in the past, our elders used to use that word mawasak, meaning getting together for the purposes of working together for the common good of the collective. Eh? And, and that's why one of our that's why our board of directors, BTK and Development Corporation uh, board of directors selected that word. So, although it is frustrating at times when you're when you're trying to justify a need, I think uh, <clears throat> Vicky said it uh, perfectly when feasibility versus social responsibility. Yeah? I think social responsibility should always be in the forefront when. When you're looking at the best interest and in health and well-being of any community, not only a First Nation community, but communities in general. Um, and uh, dealing with the bureaucracy, <laughs> it's like they want to pull, put up um, gates and walls in order to kind of um, make things more complicated when we all know that there is a need. Like right now, we are within. <clears throat> we are in a crisis within a crisis with COVID. Um, PDC alone has been impacted by the transportation of goods because of COVID, because the chief and council, our chief and council, made a decision in order to um, uh, decrease the risk of anything coming in they resorted to using only one airline to bring in 
goods for all the stores in the community. If we have three stores and there's some evening uh, confectionery stores that are open there. Eh? And that's a lot of uh, a lot of freight that comes in. And, and we feel it when we operate the community store, we feel the impact of COVID because the company that was identified and selected to do the freight runs it does not have the capacity right now to meet the demand. I was in a meeting with council the other day requesting if I can bring in another airline to do the community store freight. I wasn't given a direct answer. I was told that the chief and council would have to review that. And that the reason for that was to minimize the risk of uh, bringing COVID in from uh, like we get our supplies from Thunder Bay and Winnipeg and sometimes as far as Southern Ontario or Eastern Ontario, eh? depending on what we're looking for. And that's that's the that's the greatest impact we're having right now. A crisis in a crisis, I guess. But uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, moving forward with uh, our partner, Morgan Fuels through uh, Max Morgan. And I, uh, <laughs> I guess it's been it's been quite a journey. It's been frustrating at times. It's like banging your head on a cement wall here and there. And, you know, it looks good at times. And all of a sudden, something comes up. We didn't anticipate COVID. But I guess it was part of the part of the part of the grand master plan. And I've been stuck here since March after our trip to Toronto and I got thrown into isolation. <laughs> Norman and I went to Toronto with Vicky in the first week of March last year in 2020. A couple of days after we got home, there was an announcement from PDAC that there was somebody from Sudbury area had contracted uh, COVID. So I got pulled in with my board of directors, chief and council, and was told to isolate for two weeks. At that time, nothing was in place. So I was basically alone at my house. <laughs> but we survived it. And I'm pretty sure we'll survive it. And I'm pretty sure we can pull this off. We just need to keep on we just need to keep on uh, staying positive and uh, keep convincing the uh, government funders or potential funders that this is a real need. This is our reality, yeah. And uh, in order for that, in order for it to succeed, we need their support, and also we need their cooperation in, in realizing what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you, Bruce. Did I miss anything, Vicky? No, um, and I know we've gone over here, so, and I know she has a really tight schedule, so I, mm -hmm. I appreciate the patience, and if you have any questions or want to get in touch with us, uh, we'd be happy to uh, talk at another time as well. Contact thank you. information will be listed at the end of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Bruce and Vicki, for your presentation. It was very enlightening and eye-opening. And so next, I'd like to have a conversation with Jerry Brandon. He is a chef, an educator, a business consultant, mentor, public speaker, and he's been working in food security. He's originally from here in Ontario, where he's a member of the Doe Keys First Nation. He's a graduate of the renowned Stratford Chef School. He's worked alongside many world famous chefs, led five star country house hotels, appeared on television and in magazines. As a former troubled youth, Jerry spent many years working with and mentoring young people across Canada. His vision for First Nations is strength through education, qualified by traditional values. He spends his time in the community offering perspectives on food, life, and education. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. That was a fascinating segment, uh, listening to uh, uh, people talk about logistics and uh, and distribution on that scale. Um, it's uh, it's something that for for myself, I've stepped away from for some time now. I'm very uh, very much focused on on uh, the business that I have at hand. Um, 
trying to to build something uh, in a small community that that something that didn't exist and to see what kind of impact it can have and to represent uh, First Nations uh, culture as a, as an ongoing uh, modern uh, urban setting. I mean, uh, I've I've been uh, tossed uh, and turned uh, myself about my position as a as a uh, representative of, of First Nations. Uh, growing up scoop in a in an all white family and going to school uh, being the uh, I always say the only the only face with a tan in the winter time uh, in my classroom um, and and how that's impacted my life uh, and and I can't uh, offer the perspective of someone who's grown up on a reserve or grew up in in residential school. Um, yet I have, you know, many, many very close friends who, who, who've done that, and I've been able to, uh, fortunate enough to be able to work on, on reserves and, and teach culinary arts on uh, remotely on reserves, and to teach about nutritional value uh, and, and how you can find that and, uh, in, in some of the most uh, obscure situations uh, uh, to be found in Canada. I, I did grow up uh, hunting, fishing, trapping. Um, I remember my earliest trips to North Bay, Ontario, to the Hudson's Bay Depot to to uh, uh, trade our furs in, and not knowing that the Hudson's Bay was also a store. So the first time I saw a Hudson's Bay store, I was astounded, thinking that uh, I, I can't believe you can actually buy things from them. I thought it's the only a place you bring your fur, um, and that that was my life growing up. Uh, I did like so many people of my age leave home very early. Uh, and at one point I was an addict and homeless on the streets of Toronto. I managed to come back from that to have a, a business degree, a planning degree, a culinary degree and a teaching degree. Um, and I have, uh, uh, as a chef or as a leader, uh, general manager type person, uh, operated some of the largest uh, uh, food service uh, operations in Canada. Um, uh, here I am uh, turning 60 this year and as my retirement project I, I chose to return to the area that I grew up in and here I am almost epicenter from uh, Metachewan First Nation, Tomogamy First Nation and Temiskaming First Nation sort of traditional Algonquin Anishinaabe territory um, which had a pull on my heart uh, the entire time I was in Western Canada um, and for some reason I ended up coming back here and doing this sort of small experiment. It seems very small compared to what you guys are working on. Um, and the experiment was uh, brought about by the posing of a question, can you build community around food? Um, what kind of impact would this type of operation have? And, and admittedly, we're a, we're a very hybrid, uh, higher end uh, restaurant operation. And it's designed to be a, a cultural, uh, meeting center of sorts where people are introduced to uh, and understand that uh, maybe it's my own personal chip on a shoulder that 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 first nations can present uh, anything culturally as good as or better than um, non-first nation culture uh, i think somebody anybody that's that's indigenous will understand that the feel that that you had to be not as good as but better than to be accepted as equal and in a uh, in culinary arts that that was and certainly in business that became uh extremely obvious to me at the beginning and um so here we are uh you know looking for a, for a place to to uh to build a business um and knowing that restaurants are uh extremely marginal uh our our purpose was to build a brand and that brand was La Tactan. And La Tactan, if, if you're non-French speaking, means the indigenous. Uh, it's kind of a slang French word almost the way we've placed it. And we chose that name specifically because uh, it, we wanted it to be recognized for what it was. We wanted everybody locally to understand exactly what, what they were coming out for. And, and that's indigenous culture. Is it uh, traditional indigenous cuisine? Uh, that's a massive, massive uh, debate um, as to what's traditional. Uh, I would say we're more of a hybrid. We, we tackle things with a, a, an indigenous twist to it. I, I look at 
indigenous foods from uh, the bottom of South America to the top of the Arctic Circle and, and tackle some ingredients and some methodology and then blend it with, with my experience. At the, at the end of, you know, as I reach my retirement ages, I guess, uh, I'm starting to look at things, look at my history and go, I just want to represent, you know, my experiences um, as an Indigenous chef that have gone on for so long now uh, and all my travels and, and, you know, and I'm again, that guy that stands in a line and, and the Baja Peninsula for an hour to get the best taco you've ever had in your life. I'm that guy that, that spends, spends all his time traveling for culture. And, uh, and I hoping that I can bring some of that back uh, home with me and, and to see what kind of an impact it can have in the community. And, you know, knowing that we uh, we would uh, struggle just to be just a restaurant and the restaurant would be our brand we, we're now branching out into uh, retail and uh, and that's only that's again that's just the second step and a planned step in a in an uh, approach where we're going to uh, broaden our prospects by by laterally developing uh, around food and uh, so I think that the ne next for us will be the grocery store uh, um, which is uh, a granted higher end uh, specialty foods, uh, coffee shop, but it's, it's a bit of a hybrid business itself. And then we'll move into catering, mobile catering. We hope to have a food truck uh, and a portable bar on the road next year. Uh, and then we're actually uh, in, a, in the beginning stages of planning uh, for a possible distillery here in Halebury as well. Um, the idea behind the business uh, to an extent is, is that, you know, I, I've sat on, uh, I guess I, I sat on a number of boards with food security and sustainability and trying to achieve uh, very uh, lofty goals and uh, yet getting bogged down in the day to day. And I thought that, you know, I can build something that uh, employs a fair number of people, uh, puts a lot of money back into my local community. Um, and last year we, we put about half a million, uh, here into the local community, um, and, you know, representing the best of, 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 I think of indigenous culture in the area. And at the same time, bringing people in from a far away as, uh, uh, Delaware, Washington, DC, uh, New York, um, we've had people from overseas in here from, uh, uh Holland and Belgium and, uh, United Kingdom and, uh, where it's their first introduction to 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 anything remotely indigenous and and we want to try to represent uh something that's that's uh, approachable appealing but above all uh i guess um something that will stay with them that'll bring bring about a memory it's an experience uh that, that they'll hang on to and that they'll be able to uh, to talk about for for some time to come. And I think we've achieved that. So uh, the future for us is still to build this, uh, is to continue to build this business as it is into what will eventually become a, a cooperatively owned uh, type of business where uh, at some point we will incorporate and then, uh, and then pass shares on to the staff. And in that way, we're able to retain staff for a longer period of time. Um, as we go along, I'm, I've been, uh, and I've done this before, I was part of the first probably farm to table group in, in Canada, Knives and Forks out of Toronto with uh, uh, people like uh, Jamie Kennedy and Michael Statlander and, and uh, a lot of the guys that were really starting to get into, uh, into farm to table uh, back in the early 90s. And I'm starting to do the same thing here, which is is to literally it's hard. It's, it takes some time. I found the last time it took me about three years to track enough local sourced uh, uh, ingredients to to be able to to bring your uh, your impact down to a very small area. And I've been fortunate enough here since we've come here to to be able to to find uh, First Nations uh, that'll do foraging for us. I've found. Uh, finding local organic growers that are starting to plan their next season around what we're able to do, which I think has a, a, a larger impact uh, from a sustainable approach to, to agriculture locally. Uh, we're looking at trying to purchase as much local as we can and to see it stop being shipped from here to the south 
and then and then produced and then returned back here when you talk about uh, logistics that it's always made little sense to me to see uh, fabulous uh, products produced in in the north only to be shipped to toronto for production and then and then return north and the cost thereof um, so i guess that's that's pretty much where i'm at right now um, that's fantastic jerry i could talk well, I'm, I'm sensing between Bruce and Vicky and yourself, uh, I, I, this conversation could last for hours. There's, um, there's so much connection between it all at, at all these different levels and everybody's just plugging in, trying to do their part, but uh, there's still so much more that could be done. Um, I'm hoping you'll stay with us. The, the way we're running now, uh, we could probably do a question and answer at the end of all of this, but it would be after our one hour time frame. And I want to be respectful of everybody's time and try to keep this to one hour, but everybody's welcome to stay on. And, um, and if the panel members are willing to stay on, um, you're welcome to ask questions at that time. So um, thank you, Jerry, very much. I'm going to move on now to Red Rock. Um, Red Rock Indian Band Moose Hanger and Butcher Shop is, is our next project. And so it doesn't uh, get any closer to the, to the plate than this. Um, uh, with us today is Tim Ruth and Joanna DeCheco. Tim is the custodian and maintenance man for Red Rock Indian Band. He's also a band member along with his wife and they raised two beautiful daughters in the community. Tim's also an employee of the band and he takes on projects like this one and volunteers at many community events. He's a very active member of the community in all capacities. Uh, the other person on this project is Joanna and she's the employment counselor under the social services department at Red Rock Indian Band and she's been there for the last three years. And aside from her employment counseling role, she also sits on the Food Sovereignty Committee. She is working on a community economics and social development degree at Algoma University uh, with the intention of using her knowledge to help assist and grow the community in all of their endeavors. Welcome, Tim and Joanna. Good morning or good afternoon now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over on that side of the province, it would be. So um, I think my first question for you is, what should communities keep in mind if they want to build a stainless steel moose hanger? Well, my thoughts uh, for that were, you have to keep the seasons in mind when you begin the construction of your project. Uh, just they should coincide to meet your deadlines and allow for weather delays. And also be mindful of your storage space because for example, say a winter storm came in and you couldn't finish your construction, didn't meet the deadline, you need to um, store your materials in a place that's gonna keep it from being ruined. Um, and also having experienced labor to complete your project is really important as well. Uh, my findings were pick a good location where the community can meet so all participants can gather for the harvesting practices. Um, shop around for fabrication of the hanger, size of the hanger and cost of materials for the uh, to be used uh, and all other equipment. Examples, the chain falls, uh, fabricated spreaders to spread the moose uh, high quarters apart, and also the cement pad for the hanger to rest on. Most, uh, we also must have uh, water nearby, like running uh, water. Uh, that was some of the, uh, I guess, examples of what we need for the project to get completed, right? That, that's just the moose hanger. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a lot of planning went into the project before you even put a shovel in the ground. Yeah, more than uh, more than what we thought would uh, consist of, that's for sure. Seemed like uh, flags were coming up left and right once we started into this thing. It's like, oh yeah, who thought of that? And 
another flag would come up. Oh, we forgot about that. Just had to uh, go with the go with the flow and try to complete the tasks at hand that that popped up in front of us. So would you say planning probably took twice as long as you maybe anticipated and people should keep that in mind? I'm not sure about twice as long, but yeah, definitely keep that in mind to allow for delays and other obstacles that are going to come up. Okay, so what was the biggest hurdle then that the community faced and then overcame to get this project finished? Um, I think the biggest hurdle was uh, having experienced laborers, um, sometimes lack of communication and updating within the team and differences of opinions. So um, we overcame that uh, stuff by just by communicating with each other a little bit more. Uh, some of the biggest hurdles that I found was uh, funding sources. Uh, Getting proper quotes for all the materials to uh, construct and finish some of the uh, planning of the building. And the biggest one that we're still in is the COVID restrictions. Uh, construction of the garage package for the butcher shop. So what we did, we uh, got a hold of several quotes to design a garage package that would be uh, our butcher shop building and it is uh, 30 by 40. So within that we uh, got a cement pad built prior to ordering the garage package and then also with that then we set the garage package on top of the cement pad um, and then we started getting quotes and stuff for all the materials to go inside the butcher shop. Like we have a walk-in freezer ordered. Uh, we also have a walk-in fridge ordered um, and all equipment uh, pertaining to a butcher shop. We have uh, all stainless steel cutting blocks and tables, uh, sinks, uh, meat saws, meat grinders, uh, sausage makers. Uh, we also gonna get a, uh, a smoker to smoke some wild game. And uh, another big hurdle was to get, like Joanna says, was the experienced laborers. So tradespeople, uh, the electrical, water, uh, plumbing and heating to heat the building. And another one was the Hydro One connection from one of the one of the uh, transformers nearby the building to get uh, poles erected and a line strung across to the building. Okay. So, can you name the influences that inspired the conception of this project? It's pretty incredible. It's, you guys have a great project going. Oh, it, it's. Uh, I'm overwhelmed with how it is starting to come together. Like I, it, it takes a long time to uh, do all this stuff. Like it doesn't, it's easy, easy said to, to say the stuff that you're going to do and then put it on paper. But once it starts going, it, it takes a long, long time. So some of the influence influences that inspired the concept of this project would be uh, discussions with the, uh, community and past harvesting weeks that we've had in the, I think it was six or seven years now that we had a harvesting week or weeks in the fall where we harvest wild game, fish, uh, moose, uh, ducks, geese, and everything that is brought in by uh, hunters and fisher men and fisher women and women that go out hunting and harvesting. Um, and just everybody sitting around as a community, just kind of discussions like when we used to harvest the wild game, we used to just set up tables and everybody's back would be sore and you'd not use the proper knives and wouldn't have a proper sharpener and stuff like that. So it was quite hard. So we kind of discussed that then that we would like to have a facility like a butcher shop and a 
one location where we where we uh, hung the moose and stuff like that. So also, um, back in 2019, we were invited to a food sovereignty vision workshop um, that was put on uh, by Jessica McLaughlin. She, back then, she was with uh, Understanding Our Food System and the Indigenous uh, Food Circle. Um, she's now with a new collaborative. Hi, Jess. And um, so, yeah, we were invited there. And within that workshop, uh, we were asked to come up with a short, medium, and long-term uh, vision. So that's where we came up with the moose hanger for our short term, the butcher shop for our medium. And we our long-term goal is going to be for a tannery, hopefully. Um, and that would meet the community's need for, for food security also. Uh, also that year, we were invited to a wild game event, also organized by Jessica. And by attending these workshops, it gave us the motivation to bring our project to life and to make connections with funders, networking opportunities, and share I our ideas with other communities. Thank you. It, it, your work has been in, inspiring. It's uh, been quite the talk. Um, I appreciate that you came on today and uh, and you showed us just how much time, effort and hard work these things take from the time that it's it's uh, comes to mind to the time that it actually gets built. Um, which so in the, the words it's we're up to our last speaker now and, and it's a nice segue to talk about Jessica. Um, so just uh, Jessica is Anishinaabe and Irish ancestry from Nikina, Ontario. She's a member of Long Lake 58 First Nation. She's a mother to her son Jackson and lives in Thunder Bay, Ontario. She began working in Indigenous food systems and sovereignty, which is and relationship driven participatory community based work in 2009. Her work has evolved over the years, but in more recent years has focused on understanding and decolonizing systems in Northern Ontario that hinders progress in food, land and environment. Thank you so much, Jessica, for joining us. Miigwech. Um, I'm also here with a co-lead, Alex Boulay, who um, there's no picture because he didn't send it in. Alex, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Hi everyone. I can quickly introduce myself. So I'm I'm Jess's co-lead. Um, I'm based out of Sudbury, uh, traditional territory of Tikmikim uh, First Nation, and uh, generally the Anishinaabe um, Great Lakes of the Great Lakes Territory. Um, and I'll just leave it there for now because I know we don't have a lot of time. So Jessica, did did you want to give us an overview of uh, the Northern Ontario Indigenous Food Sovereignty Collaborative? Um, I'll give a little bit and then I'm going to let Alex, Alex does the spiel way better than me. Um, but uh, so like my intro said, Alex and I have both been working in Indigenous, uh, indigenous food for uh, many, many years. And through our work, um, a lot of that work involved funding. And uh, we were able to, like Vicki talked about in the first time, like although they're building this huge multi-purpose building, finding funding to support that, either governmental or whatever, philanthropy is a difficult task to do. Like, you know, and, and Vicki and them have been very, uh, like you guys said, very headstrong in keeping this motivated and moving so that when that funding does become available, that you're ready to go. Um, so through our work over the years, we both realized that there was gaps in funding in Northern Ontario and other, where, other places around how Indigenous communities access the uh, funding to um, do the projects like Joanna and, and, and Tim just talked about. Um, how do they do that um, and serve their community? Um, Alex, did you maybe want to just talk about like what, like give the spiel? The spiel? Uh, yeah. Sure. So, um... You know, I guess, I guess the important thing to know about what we're trying to do is, first of all, we're, we're in our first year, so um, we're, we're still a baby and we're still learning uh, uh, how we're going to work as we move forward. Uh, and we have partnered, Red Rock is one of our partners for this uh, new year, and we also are working with the Nojin Tag Health Centre on Manitoulin Island. 
um, who's also doing another project and they're helping us figure out how we're going to do the funding. Uh, and I guess that that's um, like, we're interested in decolonizing philanthropy. And part of that is um, making sure that our process is focused on, is prioritizing the needs and the solutions that are coming from communities. Whereas like what we've heard from, from Vicky and others is often the solutions are proposed from outsiders and are not necessarily appropriate. And so we're trying to invert that relationship so that what we're doing is learning from the communities and empowering them to do the things that they know need to be done. Sorry, and there's dogs in the background. Thank you. So, um, so I'm hearing that you're gonna, the work is about decolonizing uh, philanthropy. So people need to remember that. They need to remember that um, it's not market-based solutions, that the solutions come from community. And um, what would you say is a third thing that you want people to remember and repeat to others about the work that you're doing? Uh, yeah, so I, and I'll, I'll clarify. It's not that it's not that we we won't support market-based solutions, right? It's that we're going to support what the community decides they want. So if they want to do entrepreneurship or whatever, we we want to work with them on that. Uh, I guess the third thing that I would say is important to remember is that our we're really we're like we have a stewardship council. We've we've filled that stewardship council with. Um, Indigenous food sovereignty leaders and thinkers from across Northern Ontario. And we're really trying to um, use those grassroots and leadership experience to as the guiding kind of accountability mechanism for what we're doing. Um, how can organizations throughout Ontario support the collaborative that you're in your first year and you're still building? How would you like to see um, your work supported throughout the north um i think you're supporting it right now um and i and really i think it's the opposite is how do we support the communities you know we didn't embark on this journey communities and organizations and individuals because uh, and we didn't get to go into our, what our funding streams will look like in the future um but really how do we support communities with those self and and projects like vicky's in those uh, self-determined you know just using Vicky's as an ex and, and KI's example is like they live there, they know that that's what they've been seeing for many, many years. We why take that information and that knowledge away from them? Um, uh, but but like allowing communities to really determine and us to, 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 to provide the support, um, right? We we hope like we're in our first year, but our first year is rearing to an end, and uh, you you will be, I think inviting us to speak and having conversations with us. That's one of our mottos is it's relationship driven um, rather than uh, a fillable PDF. Um, it, it's about how we build this relationship and learn about your projects. Um, yeah. Did you want to take a few minutes and talk about the funding streams? I'm um, sure. So we're just working through them. So the, um, and Alex, you could forgive me or pipe in if I'm wrong, but right now we have a community-based planning fee um, uh, stream which is for communities to access and organizations to access um, with a heavy component on planning. Um, and we're still working through these nuances and we're working with Red Rock Indian Band on the butcher shop um, to uh, do an operational plan for the butcher shop as well as fund infrastructure money that they so desperately need and have a hard time accessing because we all know that infrastructure funding is really hard to find. Um, and then um, another stream is household granting. So we're looking at household granting and how do we grant to um, households? Like last time, uh, Kanina, and you guys had a, a workshop, I think it's Chris now hosted it. There was a woman who prepared an entire moose. Um, and like, how do we support families that are in community that want to share back with other community members and, and, and really start, um, uh, enabling sovereignty within households and communities. Um, so those are two funding streams that we will have. Um, and in the future, we hope to look at more of the re rematriation of land, uh, supporting more guardian programs and, and co-management of land uh, with First Nations. Uh, 
And Alex, I don't know if you want to add. Well, I guess I'll just say, like, I mean, we do, we kind of take it for granted with this group, but uh, like the purpose of what we're trying to do is to support indigenous food sovereignty in Northern Ontario, which is different than a lot of other food focused funders who are most often looking at food security, which, you know, there is a big, there is a difference about what that means, especially when you're talking about um, indigenous, uh, indigenous, uh, the history and uh, the, the, the dispossession of land and the access to land and those kinds of things, right? So it changes the frame of the conversation and we're really trying to work with our, the people, the funders that fund us to, to, to do that translation. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, our time has come to an end already. We are at the one hour mark. Uh, if anybody needs to leave, um, I thank you for attending very much. Um, I'm, yes, I'm, here's the, the contact information for our speakers. Um, so he has that. Uh, I'll do a quick shout out that the LFC is having an assembly in March. Um, there's a link on the website. Um, if our, some of our speakers want to stay and answer questions, um, more than welcome because this is such a rich conversation. It could keep going. Um, we do have a couple questions on the, um, from the chat. This one was for the, the Joanna and Tim. Where are we? Uh, is the butcher shop just for wild meat or do you have livestock producers as well who process their meat in your facility? I know it's not built yet, but are you, are you hoping it'll be only for wild meat or are you thinking there might be others who can use it? Thinking of cattle or, or farm chick or chickens, things like that. Joanna, your mute is still. Oh. Sorry. Um, actually, no, there hasn't been discussion around livestock, but I've heard um, some separate individuals hoping that they would get some chickens. And of course, that would be welcome in the butcher shop as well. Thank you. I have to disagree <laughs> with you on that because some of the uh, <laughs> regulations with uh, the butcher shops, they have to pretty much uh, apply for a different type of license when you're handling wild game and regular processed meat, I guess, like poultry and uh, beef and pork and so on. And fish, I guess, would be another one. So there's, there's supposed to be a fine line where you can uh, process those the same types of meats uh, inside one shop, I do believe. But that's something that we'd have to look into. We'll have to discuss on that. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I know there's definitely a lot of differences between, or like the provincial health, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it can get tricky, yeah. yeah. I do have another question. This was sent to me, but I'm thinking it's for the group um, or for Jessica and Alex, funding supports. Are there any real, uh, any area real rent initiatives similar to real rent Duwamish on the West Coast? I'm not sure that looks like, I'm not sure if anyone, if that rings a bell to anyone. Diane, I'm not sure what you're asking there. Um, I do have another question for Jessica and Alex. Are you guys a funder in and of yourself or do you more so connect funders with communities or both? Both. But well, yeah, um, a part of like what we want to do and like, I'll use Red Rock as an example. So through our work at understanding our food systems, I acted as, uh, not me, but my, my, the indigenous food circle at the time acted as a funder and would fund, we funded the, the, the uh, fabrication of the moose hang. 
But what we also did was connect Red Rock Indian Band with Feed the Children. So if they're a, they have a partnership with Feed the Children Canada now that is a four-year multi-pronged funding to help support the butcher shop and the operation. So if we don't have that funder in our back pocket as one of our funders that we can grant, then we would connect other funders to communities to, you know, and like me and Alex were talking the other day about stacking and I was like I want to encourage stacking like I, I love that um, and 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 I mean there's a conversation to be had around it and what does that look like for us and for other funders but um, I think that's a, a, a field that we really want to embark on. Not for sure thank you. Um, Diane if you're still in the chat if you're able to unmute and um, clarify your question some more if you're still looking for an answer you you can do that and then Jessica I don't know if that was your if uh, you were answering Diane's question I can I can speak to a little bit. I think what Diane's asking is if there's other collaboratives in Canada, and currently there's two other collaboratives in Canada, one in the Northwest Territories called the On the Land a Collaborative, and one in Northern Manitoba called the Northern Manitoba Food Community Culture Collaborative. And this is a new way, like we were talking about in the beginning of, of thinking around funding and around community-driven projects based around relationship, not necessarily around tick boxes or what Vicky was saying about you fitting into a box. Um, so we're, it's a new conversation happening. And if you Google it, like literally it's happening in other countries as well. Um, but how do we really work together to support community-based projects that we know work um, rather than, you know, telling someone no for so many years when we know the solution in Sulaco, we know the solution. So um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, Diane, just to say is like um, having conversations with um, uh, those kind of organizations reaching out, we're all open to talk and, uh, and learn if that hap is happening in your, in your area as well, in a more smaller scale. So I checked out the website that she shared there, the Real Rent um, website. And so essentially the concept there seems to be uh, settler um, people or organizations essentially paying rent to uh, the, the, the nation uh, upon which Seattle has been uh, settled. Um, so I don't know of anything like that in Canada that's a work I do. I do. Yeah, you do. So the Thunder Bay Public Library in Thunder Bay is on that conversation right now with the city of Thunder Bay about them paying, I mean, not the city of Thunder Bay, Fort William First Nation. So the library would like to pay Fort William First Nation for their space on Fort William First Nation's ancestral and ter uh, traditional territory. And I know that the Manitoba Collaborative actually pays rent to the First Nation. Um, I'm not, don't, I can't call me on who it is, but that's something that organizations really should start looking at um, and thinking about into the future. And I think that conversation will happen. Um, but yes, it is happening on smaller scales. And that's wonderful. I can't wait to look at that um, link. That was all the questions that I saw come through. Um, Suzanne, I don't know if you noticed any that I didn't see. Those are, I'm so, I loved all those projects. I think it was such a, such a great webinar and that there was just such a variety of different scales and different, different passions and drives and it's all working together to tackle uh, food and how recognizing that what a, what a lack there is for some people and wanting to address those. I loved hearing about it. Thank you, everyone. I'm not trying to wrap up for you, Kelly. I just wanted to get that, that out there. That's a wonderful so. segue to wrap up. Um, I, I'm also in love with the, the connections that we were able to make today on the webinar um, across uh, everything that's happening for food here in the North. Um, relationships, as we all know, matter to get these projects done, to uh, envision a future that's better than what we have today, um, because uh, the idea that Food, um, food insecurity should be common is, is just unacceptable. And uh, food sovereignty is, is a major part of the solution. And if we can contribute to more of these conversations to getting the work done and making the connections and deepening the relationships, 
um, then I also would conclude that maybe this webinar was also successful. I cannot thank uh, our speakers enough. Go ahead, Kanina, please. Oh, Jerry just wanted to ha make a statement before he, he takes us off. Please, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. This, this has been uh, fascinating for me. I've kind of been out of the loop with regards to food security and sustainability, being out on the West Coast where talking about uh, businesses operating on First Nations land in and around Vancouver and the lower mainland. There is just a ton of business that exists on and is paying rent on uh, uh, two First Nations bands. So if you're anybody's interested in knowing about that, I, I can help. Uh, if anybody's looking for, uh, you know, just an entrepreneurial approach to something they want to learn how to monetize a particular product or they want to work like you know for a butcher shop for example i've built several restaurants i've built uh, at least half a dozen community kitchens uh, as a designer developer uh, i'm i'm available you can always email me and if, if you want to just have somebody to bounce ideas and questions off of i've uh, pretty much done all of the funding for this uh, business i'm in now and we expect our sales will be over 2 million next year, COVID or no COVID. Uh, so that's going from, from, you know, and that's all, you know, the funding began with my own money that, you know, basically we, we've we come from Vancouver and, and came here and, and invested by buying property and, and doing this. And it's not, I know it's not on reserve, but there's so much that can be done if you tackle things uh, from a way of, of, like you say, decolonizing the funding structure and, and, for me, my way to do that was to just do it myself and not not get involved with uh, outside influencers who are trying to direct my uh, my approach to to this business. So I just wanted to say thanks, everybody. This was this was fascinating for me, and that uh, hopefully uh, people will take down my contact info, uh, Jerry at LatakDun.com, and if, if there's anything I can do for anybody, uh, just hit me up, and uh, I'd be glad to help. Wonderful. Thank you. Is, is there anyone else that would like to make um, a, a last statement before we go? We've flown over the time, so this, this would be the place to do it. Well, I just want to add, um, Kelly, um, I, Jerry, you're very inspiring and I will be in touch with you. Um, the, the one thing that we've always focused on on the Regional Distribution Center, which Kanina is very aware of, is a reverse economy. So we, you know, we did do the study, we did do a business plan around uh, wild game and fish, et cetera. And the fact that the, where, where Sulacote is located, we have 70 flights a day in our community and we can be in downtown Toronto faster than you can, they can drive to Cottage Town. So there is a, an opportunity to build that um, food, um, uh, chain and so moving down the road we'd really like to explore that more um, because there's lots of goods um, that can be shared in that reverse economy some of our communities like cat lake have already um, their commercial fishing licenses etc so there is some some good opportunity we have we have people come um, from toronto um, they leave 6 a.m in the morning and they're on the lake fishing in Sulacote before noon. So it is a reality that we could be part of your food chain as well. Fantastic. Bruce, do you have any parting words of wisdom to leave us with? Um, I just wanna take this opportunity to express my gratitude for being invited to be a part of this uh, dialogue or discussion. Um, I guess the important thing is that regardless of where we are located, there was always that need and it's very important that uh, especially when it involves food and which is related to health that uh, we continue on regardless of what obstacles we are faced with there. Eh? especially in the far north is more challenging because of the isolation factor. And uh, developing a network comes in, comes in handy at all times where we make the connection with people that are in uh, similar situations as we are. So having said that, I uh, 
want to wish everybody a new year and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, I think we will end and close out this webinar. Again, chi miigwech for everybody who came and, uh, and participated. Uh, it was deeply meaningful. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe.